All right, so this is uh, number seven in the UC Braid uh, CAI webinar series. Um, this, this one is slightly different than the other ones that we have because this one is actually going to lead to specific actions by members of the UC Braid CAI. So for those of you that don't know the background, um, the, the, the NHLBI has been saying that some of the uh, proposals that we're submitting um, really don't have a sufficiently detailed business plan that, that meets the kinds of things that they hoped we would be submitting. And I'd have to say to some extent, you know, I agree with them and I think one of the reasons why is people tend to dramatically underestimate the cost and time and effort required to put a business plan together. And so one of NHLBI's solution to this plan was to sort of say, well, why don't you guys apply to NSF's I-Course program? And I said, that'd be great if I knew what it was. <laughs> and then there's this uh, cascading series of nomenclature and jargons and acronyms that really take a, uh, a long time to sort through. And I started to get very nervous thinking that uh, we were going to have to run the CAI and get that up and running and also get an i -Corps program that was successful up and running. And then one day I got a phone call from June Lee and Stephanie Morris at UCSF and they said, well, we've been running one for years. This is no problem. We can really get this up uh, from the ground running immediately. And so this was one of my great moments of relief in terms of being involved with the UCCAI that we had somebody who really knew what they were doing around a program that was really complicated. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to invite Stephanie down and talk about what is the program, how does the program work, what's it really meant to do, and then U the UC Braid actually has a grant to get it up and started, and we're going to launch our efforts into this in early June. And so what's required to get that set up, both from the point of view of the different site heads, as well as from all the potential investigators that might apply to it. And so Stephanie agreed to come down today. We've met with her. We're starting to to plan the implementation of this. And today's presentation by Stephanie is to give you some insight in how to do it. Now, Stephanie, I'll introduce her very briefly, comes down from UCSF, where she's the director of UCF's entrepreneurship program. Mm -hmm. And she's also uh, a, a titled faculty member of NSF's iCourse program. So I hope I got that right. <laughs> she comes from the business world. She doesn't come from academia. And she and I have had numerous interesting conversations about what it really takes to try to put this together. And she's really going to be leading the effort for the UC Braid CII in this direction. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stephanie. Thanks for coming down Thank today. You. I've got my own mic. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And thanks for um, the introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Maris. And uh, if I can figure out which way is forward. Uh, it says it's not connected. Um, so while we're figuring out the technology issue here, is that? Try it now. Try it now? Oh, great. Okay. So um, I'm here because we have a program called the I-Core, Innovation Core, which is an NSF program. Uh, and it's a really exciting program. And now NIH has uh, joined with NSF, and together they're working on expanding the program. It's a national innovation ecosystem, and it's all based on a framework called Lean Launchpad, which was started by a man named Steve Blank. Some of you may have heard of him. They're, at this point, they've had over 400 teams go through the program around the country, over 100 institutions. So it's really spreading like wildfire. Oh. UCSF came into this a uh, couple of years ago, and our piece of it was to take what had been developed as a tech um, framework and ap apply it to life science, because as you know, we're very different than tech. Uh, so we developed the life science healthcare version of Lean Launchpad. And that's what we're going to be teaching for UC Braid, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, so with that background, why we do this? Well, a lot of startups fail, far too many. And the question is, can we, can we reduce that failure rate or at least make them fail more quickly so they're working on something that's likely to be viable? Uh, why do they fail? Well, it turns out it's not about the technology. We're all pretty good at developing technology, but we're not so good at figuring out what the market is, what the product should be, what the fit is between the market and the product, what the value proposition is, why, why do people value what you're thinking of developing, and, and how do you get customers? Who are the customers? Um, so that's what we're addressing here with the Lean Launchpad program. 
So traditionally, and some of you may have been a part of this, the process works like this. You develop your science or technology, and then you write a business plan. And maybe you hire a consultant to help you with the market stuff because you're not a, you're not a, a business person. Um, so you write a business plan, maybe with some outside input, and then you go look for money. And then um, after you've done all that, you set up your company and you start looking for your customers or your partners. If you're doing a biotech, you might be looking for a farmer partner who's really a customer for what you're doing. That's the way it, it's worked for decades and decades. Um, it's what we call the faith-based approach. So you, you walk in to an investor and you say, I have an amazing opportunity. Um, I've got data and I'm smart and passionate about it. So what else do you need to know? I mean, fund me. And, and that, that's not working anymore. Um, the evidence-based approach is what we, we are doing here at Lean Launchpad. It's very different. It says, what's the problem? You know, and then what's the solution that's needed for the problem? Maybe that's the solution that I already have developed for my technology. Maybe it isn't. But I better understand the problem first. Um, and I'm going to go out and test that with customers, and that's in quotes because they're not really your customers yet, they're potential customers. And in our world, customers has a very broad meaning. It's not just the patient, it's that whole complicated ecosystem of hospitals and purchasing and payers and reimbursers and the FDA. Um, so, but with, that's who we have to understand. And so with those customers, we have to validate that the solution is viable. And, and what does that mean? That means that people are willing to pay money for it. Okay? Um, and then only then should we build a minimum viable product. And we can talk about how different that is in life sciences than in tech where you can just put up a website. Um, but then once you've done that, you should test it again with customers. And it's only after you've been through this iterative loop a few times when you've got it right that you go out and look for financing. So we used to think that startups are just small companies that are small versions of big companies. But in fact, that's not the case. They're fundamentally different. Um, we now know that startups are searching for a business model. Companies are executing on a business model. They already know what it is. But startups are really pretty clueless. They can only guess. And so we used to think you could start with a business plan. You wrote it, remember, and maybe you had some help writing it. Um, you wrote the operating plan so you knew exactly what you were going to do tactically, and you had a financial model. And, and that was what you did to start a company. You know, that was sort of the all I need is a five-year forecast. If I get all those numbers right, somebody's going to be you know, really impressed and uh, looking at my revenue line and my profit, and, and then they're going to invest. But we now know that that planning really is something different than writing a business plan. And business models are dynamic. They change as you learn and over time. And plans are static. They're just a one-shot deal. So they don't work. So no more business plans. We say, don't write a business plan. It's not going to be helpful to you. So startups are not smaller versions of large companies. They're just fundamentally different. And we define them as a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Okay, temporary organization. It's going to change. And it's searching for a business model. Okay. Large companies are different. They are executing on a known business model. Small companies don't know what the business model is. They're trying to discover that, customer discovery. Large companies know their business model. They just have to be good at execution. So um, why did they fail? Why did so many startups fail? Because they're confused about searching and executing. Okay? This is the customer development flow. And we here with our little startups are in this part of the graph. We're searching. We're doing customer discovery. What is it that the customer wants and needs? What do they value? And then customer val validation going out to that customer set again and making certain that we've now got it right after we iterated. Whereas a big company is focused on building the company and, and creating um, other customers. More startups fail from a lack of customers than from a failure of product development. It's very rare that the, you just can't figure out the technology. You just can't get it right. We're all smart. We have access to lots of resources in the technical world. 
So, so that's not a reason that companies fail. They fail because they don't get the product market fit right. So they make a product, they take it out, and no one wants it. We're trying to change that. So what does a founder do? Well, they don't start you know, getting lots of office space and building their whole team and figure, having somebody count all the money. What they should be doing is running customer development. They should get everybody out and, and have them talk to customers so they better understand what the needs are and can figure out what the business model is. Um, this is called a business model canvas. You'll hear that term a number of times in this talk. It's, it's a one sheet of paper business plan. And the cool thing about it is it changes constantly. So we're focused on business models. How do you create value? while delivering products or services for customers. And you explore each of these nine different cells in, in the business model canvas. Um, there it is a little bit larger. And you can see the place to start is the value proposition. Okay, If you don't have a value proposition that works in your marketplace, you really have nothing. So that's the first thing you want to explore. You have to try to figure out what are your customer segments. Okay, who are the various kinds of customers that you are going to address? And then how are you going to reach them? What are the customer relationships? Um, I'm looking for number five, revenue streams, key resources, key partners, key activities, and cost structure. And we do it in a slightly different order for life sciences because we value certain things more than, than the tech world does. Um, and this is what it looks like in life sciences. So these are some of the topics that you would, uh, would explore under each of those. Value proposition, what's the product benefit? What's the market? What's the competitive position? Uh, customer segments, well, we have users, we have payers, we have hospitals, we have insurance companies, we have influencers, we have saboteurs, and so on. So I'm not going to take the time to go through each of these um, cells right now, but just know that there is lots of depth in each one, and you're constantly iterating over the course of of this exercise from what you learn. In the beginning, it's all guesses. And we're running a course right now at UCSF. We're in week two. And in week one, people put up things that made no sense whatsoever. Um, by week two, they came back having done a bunch of interviews and started crossing things off. No, this isn't a value proposition that anybody cares about. So I'm going to cross that off. I got it wrong, but I think this is one I can add on because this is what a bunch of my interviews said. Um, so you do that with each piece of this model, and it's a very dynamic process. So how do you change guesses into facts? All right, we started with a lot of guesses. Um, so that's what we do in customer development. We go out and find out what the problem is. We just listen to people. We interview them and we say, tell me about the job you have to do in, in, your, in your, your work. And what's difficult for you? Where, where are the hang-ups? And, and you listen for problems. And then once you have a really good understanding of the problem, then you test the solution you have in mind and see if it resonates with anyone. That's the product market fit. This comes from a very famous accelerator, Y Combinator, and it's very basic. Make something that people want. That's what we're trying to do here. So how do you do that? Well, you don't stay in your lab. You don't stay in your clinic. You don't stay in the hospital. You get out of the building. And it's a phrase you'll hear many times during this course. So get out of the building. You know, go talk to people. And it's really tempting to stick around the, your building in academe or maybe even the next building on campus, but that's not getting out of the building. It's going out and talking in the real world, the real users, um, and interviewing them. So you have to get good at an interview skills. We'll teach you some of that. Um, but that's the basis of this course. It's doing lots and lots of interviews. And the more you do, the more you'll learn. So we're saying you have to do 10 interviews a week, which is over the course of, of this um, plan, it's at least 75 interviews. When we run the 10-week course at UCSF, we tell them 100 interviews, okay, 10 a week. So um, you will find as you do, if you do five interviews, you may think you have the answer, you don't. You need to go out and do 20, 30 interviews before you start to get an understanding of, of the piece that you're exploring. It's really important. So that's what this is about. 
And from that, you're going to frame your hypotheses for commercialization. So who's the customer? What's the right product? What's the value proposition? What's the product market fit? Who's going to pay for this? If you can't find a payer, you don't have anything. And that's really a revelation to people who think that I've got this cool technology and take it out, someone is going to pay. Well, who's going to pay for it? So really important piece, reimbursement, the regulatory path, IP landscape and partners and, and other things. But this is a sampling of what you're going to learn. So each week you update your business model canvas. And again, you do it dynamically. So you get up and you cross things off and add things on. And there's color coding to show you, you know, that this segment fits with these relationships. And um, by the end of the, the class, you have a very messy canvas. It doesn't look anything like the canvas you started with. Because remember, all you had were guesses. You don't know. Now you're getting data. You're getting evidence. This is um, a team that was presenting. So the, the structure is every week, every team presents. Okay? And, they and what they present is what they learn from their interviews that week. So th this is, um, and this is another course, uh, sorry, another team that's presenting uh, what they found out about the market. So um, again, this is the exercise you go through, is there's nobody lecturing at you. You are telling the, the, um, the group, your cohort that you're participating in, uh, what you learned. And, and then you get questions from the teaching team and feedback from everybody. Um, the, we can look at the canvas week to week so we can see what the changes are. And one of the things that happens quite frequently, almost always in fact, is that you have to pivot. In other words, you have to change a major element of your business model based on what you've learned from your interviews. Um, that's a good thing. Okay, we want you to pivot because if, if you're getting evidence that is different than what your hypotheses were, and the evidence is we have the, we're working on the wrong problem or we're going after the wrong customer segments, we want you to change and, and adapt. We use a flipped classroom, so you watch all the lectures on Udacity, which is a, an online uh, resource. And so when you come in, you already know what a value proposition is, what a customer segment is, you, what kinds of channels there are. And so we, we don't use class time to go over these basic concepts. You're going to build a minimum va viable product. So if you're doing digital health, that's going to be an app. Um, some sort of a, a, a beta, most likely, during the course. If you're doing a medical device, maybe it's a schematic. If you're doing a therapeutic, maybe it's, a, it's what pharma wants to see out of a therapeutic in this area. So in each case, we will have a minimum viable product defined. And, um, and if it turns out that you really don't have anything that resonates with the marketplace, it's okay. We actually celebrate failure um, because that means you haven't wasted years of your time and the university's resource or anyone else's resource um, to build something that nobody wants. And so the mantra in the valley, Silicon Valley where I come from, is fail fast and fail often. Don't waste your time working on something that doesn't have a product market fit. Um, one of the things that's really important is you will be working in a team. Why is that important? Well, it simulates a startup, and it's a good way for you to test out whether you want to do a startup. Um, you have all the pressure of a startup in this course. You, we're going to challenge you. Um, you're not going to know what to do next, necessarily. You have to learn quickly. You have to fail quickly. You have to pivot. You have to admit, no, I was wrong. Um, this isn't working. Let's figure out what else we should be doing. So just like a team in a startup, you're outside your comfort zone. And we have unreasonable expectations. We want to see you perform. We're going to push you. This is not a laid back, you know, take it easy kind of course. You are under the gun for the entire time. You have to do those interviews. You have to report on them. And you have to stand up in front of all your peers and the teaching team and tell people what you found and be challenged. Um, this, uh, these are metrics that the teaching team can see which um, tells you how many interviews, actually everyone can see this, um, pieces of it, tells you how many interviews you've, each team has done, um, how many hypotheses they've tested, and how many hypotheses we've crossed off. 
So um, it's called Launchpad Central. And we can read all your interview notes on it and, and know what's going on with you because that helps us as a teaching team and mentors know where you are and what you need to probe and, and how to direct you. Um, okay, I want to play a video. And my assistant here is going to help do that. To show you. This is a final video from one of the teams that went through the NIH course in December. And every team has to make a two-minute video um, and to tell what they found out over the course. So protection of normal tissue from radiation damage is important to you. Let's ask a different question. How much does that cost? This opened up a whole question of a, an unmet need. And through our maze of conversations with many people from regulatory to clinical realm, by week six, we had a very busy canvas. At the end of the i -Corps, we are now in the process of rephrasing our questions and really clearly understanding the need in that area and who the additional customers might be. Secondly, we have narrowed down what the customer wanted from our drug. Third, this thing that we didn't even come in to look at, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, is still on the table. And lastly, we have learned a remarkable process that allows us to be highly focused, and we have learned a tool of trade that we can now repeat. This has been a tremendous value to us. And that, okay. Okay, so I wanted to give you a sense of what it, the experience was like for a team that went through the NIH course that was run in Washington just in December. Um, they worked with a syllabus that we created at UCSF and that we would be using for UC Braid uh, with whatever enhancements there are. And um, you can see the power of this technique. This is, this is one team I could show you you know, 50 teams that would say the same kinds of things. They learned a tremendous amount that they never would have anticipated. They wouldn't have even known the right questions to ask. So just a, a few things on um, the logistics. We are starting this class in the second week of June. It's going to actually be three days on site at UCSF. There'll be five weeks of webinars where you are going to be standing up and presenting what you've learned. And then there'll be two days at the end of the class where you do your, uh, some more training and then your final presentations. This is the preliminary schedule. Uh, we would run applications in early April. We would be screening the week of April 12th initially and actually have interviews the week of April 27th. Um, this could change a little bit, but to give you a general sense, this is the schedule. And now I'm ready for questions. Yes. I don't know if I need a microphone or just pick it up. So okay. So, so I have a question for you. I, I guess by looking at this, I can see it two ways. You can run this as a hypothetical. People can come in with a you know, mock project. You can assemble any team together and go through this. The other hand, I could see people coming in with their own team. They don't have their own problem solution, product concept mm -hmm. in mind already, and they're utilizing this to help launch that, that startup effort. What, what do you see? Who comes to the program? Great question. So, you know, we'd love people to be working on real ideas. And especially since this is part of CAI, there are people who have real ideas that they're working on. Um, so it's not a manufactured idea. And there will be people who don't have any ideas, um, and that's fine. They could become a team member of, of, with somebody who's got the idea. Um, and there'll be people with ideas that maybe want to combine because it makes sense to put two ideas together or just take their idea through and see what happens. So again, this is real. We, we hope that in addition to teaching some great skills for entrepreneurship, people will actually start companies and they will be successful in getting funding from NIH and, um, and because they ha now have a pretty solid commercialization plan. Did I answer that? You sure did, thank you. Good. Could you just repeat his question so people didn't catch it? Ah, why don't you, can you repeat? Yeah, I was wondering about, yeah, thank you. So the question was, who, who actually takes an I-Corps training class? Is it people that want to learn about the process, has no experience, so they're running this as a hypothetical kind of, uh, you know, new startup concept? Or are these people that have already banded together, have a team, 
have a product concept in mind and they want to uh, take that forward. Yeah, and just to add, you don't have to have a team put together already because a lot of people have ideas and no teams. But that's what the matchmaking process that we're going to be running on all the campuses will do, is it'll help people identify each other. Um, interesting idea, I'd like to work on it, or I want to join that team. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, you talked a little bit earlier in the day about IP and IP protection, so could you talk a little bit about that for people out there that might be worried about it? Great, thank you for that question, Mike, because that comes up all the time. Um, so this is a business class, it's not a technical class, and we frankly don't want to hear about your technology in depth. All we want to know is what problem is it solving. And so it's a very different level. If you were looking to raise money in Silicon Valley, there is not a VC in the world who will sign a confidentiality agreement. So you better learn how to describe what it is you've got at a level where you're not giving away the store. And we can do that in life sciences. So the example I like to give is, you know, you're working on a drug. Are you going to talk about the mechanism of action? No, you're not, because that's an IP issue. But you are going to talk about the target product profile, right? What, what does it do? What problem does it solve? So IP is not a consideration here, and we don't, everything is open. We don't sign confidentiality agreements at all. In fact, Steve Blank loves to post everything on his website, so. <laughs> Are there any questions from the webinar world? <laughs> no. Well, I, I have a bunch of questions. So I'll just Great. Right. <laughs> Please. So, so one of the things is, is that to make this thing work, there are a bunch of different responsibilities for different groups. So let me like sort of run through them, and then maybe you can walk through, at least in a hypothetical fashion, what you might see as a sort of optimal thing. So there are the site heads in UC Bray that have to bring some of their favorite programs forward because I like this program but it doesn't have to have a business plan so they're going to have to do something. Then there's the PI on the grant, he's going to have to do something. Then a team's going to get formed so like who could be the people on the team? Would they be maybe the PI, maybe a, a postdoc, maybe someone from the business school, I mean who fits in? Then there are mentors that have to get matched up. So that's all before you start the course. Then when you take the course, they're going to have to go up to San Francisco and take the course. So how many times do they have to do, go up to the course? You know, you, I saw you had like presentations in between. So are those done by Skype or by whatever? Mm -hmm. And then the final thing there. So just sort of walk through that whole thing if you could. I can repeat it slowly. Sure. Yeah, I, want, I may but, need you to, but okay. sure. Um, so first thing is that everybody on the team has to do the work. So what doesn't work is for the PI to say, okay, I'm on your team, postdocs, you go do the interviews. Doesn't work, everybody is out there interviewing. So we're all workers here. Um, and teams can uh, be mixed. Actually, they're, they're really strongest when they're mixed. So they're not just um, three people working in a lab or three people in the clinic who've been working together. There may be an MBA from uh, the business school in, in your local area. Or, or your own campus, maybe there's an engineer on the team, and maybe there's computer science because you're building an app, and I'm sure it'd be handy to have a CS person there. Um, and something we've done successfully at UCSF is to bring in the business community. So somebody who actually is working in a company, maybe a scientist, maybe a business person, but who knows what the commercial world is like and what those demands are like, super valuable. So that was the first question. Go that ahead, Mike. <laughs> So now when you bring in the, the mentors, so that's what you do, the teams don't have to bring in the mentors. You find people in... Well, not me, but all the campuses will find mentors. All right, yeah. so that's one thing that the campuses have to do, is they have to find mentors that are matched to the specific kinds of programs coming through. Yeah, and, and what we have done is we have a mentor pool. We ask who's interested in, in being a mentor for Lean Launchpad. And then we have a mentor mixer with the teams. They get to see what the teams are working on, and they sort of self-select and like, wow, I'd really like to work with this team. And also the cohort heads will figure out um, which, which mentor is best qualified for a team. And then hopefully there's a good match there, and the mentor's excited about working with a particular team and vice versa. So, so talk a little bit then when the project kicks off about where it kicks off, how long it takes, yeah. going back and forth, and 
in between? Sure. So there are, there are really only two trips to lovely San Francisco Bay Area. Um, one is in the beginning, those first three days, where you, the, there's an intensive um, introduction to not only what this is all about, but also the class culture, if you will. And then you go back to your home campus and you work um, with your team, and the team could be all together with you or, or maybe not. Um, and, but every week there's a webinar, and, and it's a WebEx, and the instructors will teach the teams on this WebEx, and everybody, it's just like being in a class. Everybody comes, everybody stays for three hours and participates and presents. So there's a presentation every week. And then after the five weeks are over, uh, we'll probably build in an extra week because July 4th is in the middle of there. Um, at the end of July, you will come back to UCSF for two days and finish up. And, and that finish includes presentations about, it's not, a, it's not an investor pitch, so unlike many entrepreneurship classes, we're not pitching. What we're doing is explaining what our journey has been. It's, it's kind of like the, the video you just saw for BCN. It's like we started out thinking that this was our market and our value proposition, and then we found out that these people really weren't interested, and so we pivoted and we did. It's that whole story that you're gonna be presenting along with the video. Yes. So do the different members of a team perform different functions? So no, they don't. Um, Unlike, um, unlike some other ways, is because we have the flexibility to do this the most effective way, uh, we think that the best thing to do is let the team figure it out. There's, no, there's a team lead, um, and, and that person helps direct the whole thing, but everybody pitches in and does whatever they're best suited to do. Yes? How do the groups identify the, 100, the 75 to 100 interviewees? Well, they're going to have to work at that. So um, we don't give you names. You're going to have to go figure it out yourself. You have mentors. They, they should help. Um, you have other members of your team cohort, and, and they should be able to help some. But you, this is what the process is. This is like real life. In real life, nobody hands it to you on a platter and says, go call on these 25 people. They're going to be your customers. You have to go figure it out, and that's the, the process that you're going through. I'd add to that, and some of the, the, the people you're going to interview are going to be nominated by some of the early interviewees. If you leave that as a question, who else should I be Oh, talking good. Yeah, about? excellent, excellent point. So every interview should end with, can you recommend three other people that I should connect with? Or, or do you know anybody at this organization, if you want to be more specific? And it, it will build. So the first interviews are the hardest, and you will progress and get better and better at it, and then you will also expand your network because of that. People may ask about the practicality. What uh, time commitment have the teams told you they have to put in each week? Yeah, great, great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so, so we tell everybody to expect you're going to spend 15 to 20 hours each per week. So this is, this is a serious activity. This is, you have to make this a priority. Um, it's probably the best time commitment, the best time expenditure you'll make in your company in the early time because it's going to save you years. I could have played that video where one of the teams, which was headed by the chief of general surgery at UCSF, so you know a guy who's pretty, pretty experienced but not in business, the team came back in week two and they said, well, we just found out that surgeons don't think they need this thing. We, and so we asked them, well, did that save you anything? He said, oh, that saved us years, literally years. And that's the way it is. So you're going to put in a very intense effort for a short period of time, but it's going to make such a huge difference in everything you do afterwards that it is completely worth it. And we've had teams tell us, you know, this is the best thing I've ever done. I've been working on this project for four years or for, you know, whatever. And, and this is, I had no idea. This is the best way I've ever used my time. Great question. Thank you. So, so somebody that went through the earlier course told me either people drop out or they get thrown out. So how often does that happen? <laughs> Well, we don't really throw out very many people, but if you, if you stand up 
I have to confess, I did this to the UCSF cohort going through now. One team stood up, um, you're supposed to walk in with five interviews before the course starts. And um, they stood up and we said, how many interviews did you do? And they said two. And there were five people standing in front of the room. And to me, it was just, well, they obviously didn't take this seriously. So we said, wait a minute, there are five of you guys up there, and you're telling me you did two interviews? Sit down. We don't want to hear from you. And they sat down, and the next week they did 15. So um, there is a bit of a learning curve here, which is this course is all about the interviews. If you don't do that work, you're not going to get anything out of the course. And, um, if, and since this is a course that's being looked at very carefully by NIH and CAIs, they want to know that you are willing to and motivated to put in the effort to come up with the right plan. So, so I, I imagine when people make these calls, they're making a lot of contacts, and some of them might be valuable. So have you gotten any feedback about that, about in terms of like the impact that it has on them moving them forward well beyond the course in terms of just people they're talking to and contacts that they make? Sure. Yeah, another great question. So yeah, actually, sometimes teams come out of this with deals. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Or angel investment. And you know, it's not the intention of the course to get you there, but it happens. You know, people get interested and they come back and say, well, look, you know, let's work on this together. And um, so it has, it has some very positive consequences. And, and when you do go look for investment, if you walk into an investor and start by saying, I've just talked to 75 or 100 people, let me tell you what I've learned and why we're doing this, it's incredibly powerful. It's way better than coming in saying, here's my business plan. I think that the, you know, we're going to really blow all the socks off this marketplace. Yeah, how do you know that? Um, could you talk a little bit about how this program um, specializes in some of the, I'll say, life sciences, med device areas, as opposed to just the generic i -Corps course? Great. Yeah, so th that's specifically what we did at UCSF. We approached Steve Blank, and we said, we want to do this course. And he said, nah, I, I'm a tech guy. And we said, that's OK. We, we're life science people. We can provide that piece for you. So I brought in experts from each of the areas of life science. And we split it into four different areas, therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, and digital health, and worked with them to create a curriculum that makes sense for us. And so that team. Um, some of which went and taught at the NIH in December, and some of which is teaching again at UCSF now, has been refining the curriculum as they go along. And you're right, it's, we're different in life sciences. We are not tech, so it's not, you know, take a weekend, throw up an app, let's see if anyone likes it, and, you know, with $5,000 we can get something out on the marketplace. We have therapeutics. We have you know, devices. We, ha we have a tough life, right? Um, but this course now has integrated all that into the content so that we, that that's what we're teaching people how to, how to operate in our world, but using this technique, which is, again, very powerful. Even if you don't, you know, we don't expect anyone's going to make a drug and take it out and give it to Pfizer and say, what do you, what do you think? Do you like its characteristics? But we, we know what it's going to take to partner with a Pfizer like company. And so, you know, we, we focus people on figure that out. Figure out what a Pfizer might want to know and what would it take for you to partner. So we've adapted the course. So, so sometimes people don't know how much value is to what they have. Is there any benchmarking of deals that they do? So if they do think about licensing, how much it might be worth, does that figure into any of this? We, we actually don't focus on valuation. Um, I mean, certainly there are ways that people can find that out and, and a mentor could help somebody source that information. Um, but no, this is really focused on, do I, am I addressing a problem that anyone cares about? And do I have the right solution? Not, you know, what can I get for it? But that's all part of secondary research. So if you're doing the right background research to understand your competition and so on, that would, that would certainly be an element of it. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing those of you in the room and those of you out on the web um, to join some of our mixers, to find out more about it, to read uh, steveblank.com. Steve uh, has 
posted tons of videos and information about the course. He writes a blog. And if you research the UCSF course and the NIH course, you'll focus in on the life science pieces of it. And um, I welcome you all to learn more and, and come join us if it's the right thing for you. Thank you.